Hi. Um, I apologize in advance. Uh, I don't speak any Italian, although there is one Italian slide in this deck, just because of where we are. Uh, I also like to apologize for bringing the English weather with us. Um, it was just as bad where we left England. Anyway, um, this is, as it says, it's an introduction to Moose, which is a Perl OO framework that if you haven't heard of yet, you really should. A uh, little bit about me. Um, I currently work for BBC uh, for the iPlayer team, which is the um, TV on demand system that largely uses Catalyst um, and a bit of Moose and a few other things. Um, before that, I used to work for Yahoo Europe. Uh, um, before that, I used to work for CrickInfo.com, who were one of the biggest single sport flights uh, in the world. And I'm also a board member of EdLightPearl.org, which, if you haven't heard of, I strongly recommend coming to Mark's talk tomorrow afternoon, give a wave, Mark, uh, where you will learn lots about EdLightPearl. So, why Moose? Uh, we need a bit of history, really. Um, if you go back to the murky depths of Perl 5, okay, in the beginning there was actually Perl well before version 5, but Perl OO starts in version 5. And there was a fairly sort of do-it-yourself approach to Perl OO. Um, Perl doc, Perl toot still has quite a bit of documentation about that, but I'm sure if you've done any Perl OO, you're familiar with that construct. Uh, which is very much roll your own objects. Um, and of course, then you start getting more complicated because you start having to add accesses and methods and sooner or later your code gets to absolutely insane levels of complexity. And it's a bit of a hack. Um, and it was never really a first class part of the language. You were always having to basically implement your own object oriented code on top of Perl. Uh, so, Various people started writing helper classes to make it easier. Just the odd one or two or three or five or twenty or more. Um, and they all did some part of it. Some did some bits a bit better than others, and some did all of it pretty <laughs> dreadfully. And um, yes, there are more, really, many more. I was quite appalled when I actually went through CPAN. I'm sure this isn't a complete list by any stretch of the imagination, but there are an awful lot of classes that pretend to help you to do OO in Perl, and I have to know that's the last one I found. <sighs> Enter. So, what's Moose? Uh, it's a postmodern OO framework for Perl. Now, your guess is as good as mine, but um, step a little bent by that. But effectively, what it does is it deals with that bit we were looking at there the whole blessing hashes and farting around and doing things that are in general incredibly irritating um, and leads you to go with the bit that you're actually paid to do which is writing good OO good code. Okay. Um, um, it's not a hack by any stretch of the imagination. It's using an awful lot of production code. You'll see lots of modules on CPAN using it. Uh, there's code live with Yahoo using it. There's code live in the BBC. Quite a lot of iPlayer relies on Moose. Um, it's all over the shop. Um, and it makes writing Perl object-oriented code so much easier. So, Moose, my first class. Package person says, class called person, use Moose, and then we say has, let's give this class one attribute, which is a name. So we say has name, and we say is read write. Now, at the point we've done that, immediately we have for free a new method. So I can now say person arrow new, and I will get the instance of person. And we've also got an accessor for this attribute called name, so that I can do this. My person, person arrow new, I can then say dollar person arrow name Mike, and if I go print dollar person arrow name, print Mike, simple. So 
There you go. You've already got more code in what have we got there? Let's have a look back. One, two, three, four, five, six lines of Perl than you were getting in a whole screen full back in, back in the old days. We can have a method. And methods look just like they do in um, anywhere else. Um, sub, and yes, I pointed out the first mistake in the slide, there should be a my dollar selfie shift there. Further on in this slide deck, you'll find ways around having to do that, but for now, you do. So, again, here's your example. My little person, person I knew, person I named Mike, and then the dollar person I reproduce says, I'm Mike. Brilliant. What if you don't want to change names? So we can, instead of saying has name is RW, we can say is RO for read only. And we've got the same introduce method with the same error in it. Uh, and we now say use person, my dollar person equals person error new. Person name Mike, and it complains at us because we've tried to set the value of a read only attribute. Now, if you start to think about it, that's not terribly useful because um, you've got to set it somehow. And so, what Moose actually provides is in the constructor, you can pass a hash of name value pairs which assign to the attribute. So, I can say, there's no new name error Mike. And that will set it on the construct. But once I've constructed it, I can't change that value. Okay. Moving on. Um, has is quite powerful. It's got a lot of useful stuff in it. Um, you can change, for example, if you want to change the name of the reader access subroutine, instead of calling it name, I can say reader get name. At which point, if I want to get to it, I go person error get name, and that will return me the name. Equally, the writer I can call set instead. Initarg is the value of this hash key. It defaults to the attribute name, but if you want to change it to something else, you can do. And require says if I don't go pass it in on construction, it's an error. So since people always should have names. I can set that, which means that when I create the object, if I don't pass in a name, it will blow up. That in itself is pretty cool, but wouldn't it be nice if you could do it more than that? So, the other thing that has sports, has sports, is types. Is a, says, this is of type string, which is a string. Now, Moose provides a bunch of um, internal types, but on top of that, you can define your own which I'll get to in a little bit of detail later. But essentially what happens here, if we take our little example that we've been using, my dollar person, person error new, dollar person error name Mike, that works because it's a string. Dollar person error name empty array ref, doesn't work because it's not a string. So I get an error. So you could, and you can do some quite complex things with that. You can define types that say, has to be a positive integer has to be a string that's all capitals, or whatever you like. There's a whole bunch of types which make writing code that actually um, stops you blowing yourself up. Handy. The other useful thing you can have is that in the absence of a defined type, it'll treat the string as a class name. It's really handy because it means, basically it means DOB, the date of birth, must contain an object, which is a class date time. Which is fab, because I can now say, I have a person, person I renew, set my name, I can then set my date of birth via date time I renew, year is 1963 months. And that date of birth attribute now contains a date time object. So I can do all the standard date time things like DOBR a year, Return 1963. So that's that's actually pretty handy. That gets you an awful lot of, of um, control over what goes in your object attributes and so on. Next thing you obviously want to do if you're doing OO is subclasses. So Moose has a keyword extends, and extends is just like use base. It says this is a subclass. So we'll define a student. Class. I'm going to use this one quite a bit in later examples. So, 
um, and student, students are people, contrary to what some think, some, some people might believe. Um, and certainly where I come from, I've not yet met a student who has money in their bank account. Um, so we have a boolean type, this, this is another type, another mill is built in type boolean, we'll define an attribute overdraft, which is boolean, which says whether or not they're overdrawn at the bank. We can also, it would be nice to have a list of what classes they're taking. And this is an example of a most compact type. Um, hashref is a ordinary type, which would just say classes is a hashref. But if we say hashref stra, then that means that every value in that hashref, hashref has to be a string. Now that's obviously not particularly difficult. But I could, for instance, say hashref of date time, or hashref of some type I've defined which can check whether it's a valid class or not, which is good. We can also, as well, all magic with hash has, we can have required. And required, we've said before, requires us to, why is that sliding there twice? Um, moving on. Um, defaults. Sometimes, if you're feeling lazy, you don't necessarily want to define out every attribute when you create a class because, you know, some of our values are obvious. Like I said, certainly in the UK, all students have overdrafts. So we'll set the um, default value for overdraft to true. Um, but we can do cleverer things than that. Let's, let's suppose, for instance, we have a bank account object, um, which almost certainly hasn't been. And let, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that there's some magic here that actually goes and talks to the bank and finds out what your student's bank account bank balance is. So we can define an object on a student, an attribute on the student called account, which is a bank account, uh, is read write, and that should probably read only actually, uh, and is required. Um, and then we can redefine our overdraft object in terms of that, because what we can say is first of all, we say lazy equals one, which says don't bother working out the value for this until you need it. And then we can actually, instead of setting the default to be a constant, you can set a piece of code to run. And this piece of code basically goes and looks at the account and sees if the bank balance is negative. And if the bank balance is negative, it'll set overdraft to true, otherwise it'll set it to false. That's one way of doing it. Uh, Moose has another nice little bit of syntax where you say lazy build, and lazy build is, is very much like saying lazy and default, but instead of setting a default here, you define a subroutine called build and the name of the attribute. It's underscore build, underscore the name of the attribute. And that does exactly what default does. default does. When you come to need the attribute, it will put the value in that. The difference is that in general, you want to use this if you've got to do something complicated to build your default, rather than just sticking a little, little one line sub, um, then you'll probably want to use lazy builder. Okay. Um, Inheritance and method modifiers is another fun thing you can do. Um, given, your, given your student, um, let's wrap the, if you remember person, have an introduce method which simply said I'm dollar name, whatever your name was. Let's say for students when you introduce yourself, you also want to say what course you study. So we say after introduce, print studying dollar self of course. Now what will happen is that when you call introduce on a student, it will call the method on parent, and then it will run the contents of this. So we'll get exactly what we expect. Let's create a student object, the name is Mike, of course it's computer science, person I introduce, I'm Mike, and that comes from the person object, from the parent object, and then this extra bit, the studying computer science, sorry, wrong way, right. comes from the after. So we've basically created a way of wrapping methods in, in subclasses. In a similar manner, there's a round. Now a round is when you can't do, it, do something quite that simple. And what you in fact need to do is call the method on the parent and do weird stuff with it. <coughs> so a round is a little bit odd in that unlike most methods in Perl.io, 
um, dollar self is not its first value, it's its second. Dollar next is in fact the method on the, simplistically it's the method on the parent. It's the next method, it's the next version of that method of the inheritance chain. So you can say dollar self arrow next with the args. So effectively what we've done here is we print high, we call the method on the parent, which if we remember we'll say I'm Mike, and then we call, then we print studying dollar self arrow course. So that will get us this, where that comes from the around, that comes from the parent, and that comes from the around. Okay. Next up, one of the cooler bits of this, roles. Now, roles originally come from small talk clause and a few other languages. They're basically they're little bits of code that provide a, a small reusable behavior. Um, in, you'll see that from an example, but they're not inherited, they actually become a part of the consuming class. Um, you can, in fact, override them, although there's some great philosophical arguments there. And it's like multiple inheritance, but it doesn't suck. I think will be an accurate summary. So, role. This is a role class. You can see it's exactly the same as an ordinary moves class, instead of saying use moves, instead of use moves roll. Uh, has a date of birth, and has an age. And basically what this does is we have an attribute called date of birth, which is a date time object. Um, <coughs> we have a method called age, which takes today's date, um, takes it, subtracts the date of birth, uh, and returns the number of years, which is as good a way to calculate itself as age as any. So, can't we now say, package person creates a person class, use moves, and then we say with age, which basically says consume the age role. And at this point, our person object now has the date of birth attribute, and it has an age method. So we can change our much loved introduce method again. So it has to print, I'm my name, and this is my age, and that age method that age comes off the roll, and it will calculate our age, much like we expect it to. Now, we've gone even gone one step further here, because you notice that um, we're actually creating an object class student. So not only have we got, we've inherited, um, we've inherited from parent. From parent, we've also picked up the age role, so that students have a date of birth object as well, the date of birth attribute as well. And um, so calling introduce on the student, which if you remember, we also had the around method on maps to wrap it with the high and the studying, gives us that from the around method, that from the original person object, that from the role, and, and that from the, and, and the studying CS from the around as well. So basically, we've got both an inheritance and a role composition here, which may not be something you really want to do. But still. Now, one of the things you may have noticed about this is that this is getting to be a pain because we're having to construct a date time object every time we create a new, um, a new student or person object. So wouldn't it be nice if we could actually um, simply say date of birth equals some simple format string. That's an English date order, not an American, so that is 5th of August, not the uh, 8th of May. So, but we can do that, because what we can do is, let's go back to our role, and let's redefine date of birth to be a date stra. Now, we don't know what date stra is yet, we haven't defined it. So let's go define it. Date stra, we'll say it's a subtype of String, and then this where is a condition is, is a piece of, is a code fragment that validates um, our, our string. And so, if our string turns out to be um, two digits dash two digits dash four digits, we'll treat that as a valid date string. So we can now type check that what we've been passed looks like. Going back to slides, we can now type check our date of birth looks like that. But that doesn't help us on its own because that's obviously not something we can just pass the date time. So, 
what we do is we invoke the magic of moose active moose util type constraints and the coerce keyword. And coerce basically allows us to say, if I have one of these, here's how I make it into one of these. In this case, if I have a string, here's how I make the date to time. And in fact, what I do is I split it up in dashes into day, month, and year, and then I return a date, time, hour, and new. Return a date, time object with a day, month, and year. In. Great. There's one last thing you have to remember to do, which is when you define your object, you have to say, notice we now say it's a date time, not a date struct. Um, but we do say coerce equals one. If you don't say coerce is one, nothing happens. You will pass it, that string to your blue in the face, and it will give you an error. If you say coerce is one, it says look at any coercions for this type, and if the value you've been passed, the value you've been passed matches, then go ahead and um, coerce it. So this now allows me to say, much as I wanted to, my daughter person, student are in you, date of birth equals nice easy human readable string with no code in it, um, print out the age, and it does look everything you wanted to behind the hood. The other nice thing you can do with roles is you can use them like Java style interfaces. You can say this class must provide the following methods. Um, so one of one of the examples here, let's have a package, a role called earnings, which works out somebody's monthly earnings. It requires a method called annual income. And what that says is if I ever apply this role to a class, that class must provide an annual income method. So here we have another extension of the um, person and student classes. Person now consumes the earnings role. Uh, student extends person as before. And the student has an annual income method that says return whatever the government gives me as a student from. And if I now call um, if I now call monthly income, it will in fact fetch month on the student, it will in fact fetch it from this role. It will call the student's annual income method. Now for example, um, I could define another package which inherits from person with a completely different annual income method, and provided that um, it returns something that doesn't cause the earnings role to trip up. It'll be fine. But there are a few gotchas with roles. Um, roles can't use extends. You can, roles do not have an inheritance tree. They all compose onto the main class. Um, requires only work. I don't know if that has that changed now, Matt. Can you do requires on attribute accesses? Yes, you can. You didn't use to get it. Shows how long it is since I gave this talk. Um, it used to be the case that you could only um, requires an actual method. You can now actually require um, an attribute accessor, which is so indeed for now. Um, and the world gets horribly messy if you if you mix up your attributes and your methods. Okay, another sweet thing we can do: method delegation. Um, let's define the. This, this, I suspect, won't translate very well because I doubt that Italian universities hand out grades the same way that we do. But in the UK, you can have a first class degree, a 2 1, a 2 2, or a 3. So, another little type construct here, we can find an enum which says that anything of grade must be one of those four values. Um, now, let's define a degree package which has grade as an attribute and the data is awarded as an attribute. And again, we've We've said coerce on this so that we can do the do the lazy thing. Um, and a graduate. A graduate is a student who has a degree. So an extended student and has a degree attribute, which is a type degree. So I can now say my little G graduate are new. Basically we construct a graduate object, we construct a degree object, we set graduate to have a degree, and we can find out what year I got my degree. Great. There's a better way to do it now, because another bit of magic on has is handles. Handles says for every method in this hash here, for, for every key in this hash here, if I want to call the graduated method on student, on graduate, then I should call instead 
the awarded method on the object that's stored in this field. So you saw before how I called degree arrow awarded. If I now call instead G arrow graduated, that says graduated method handled by this attribute by calling this method on the object. More oh, sweetness. Um, how long have I gone? 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay. There are a few other things you can do with um, attributes. For instance, going back to our classes, we had a classes attribute on the student, which was a hash ref. And we originally had it a hash ref strings. Instead, we're going to define a type result which says you either pass or fail your class. Um, and we can say predicate has classes, which will basically look to see whether there's, any, there's anything in that attribute. And that's just a, a setting test. The other thing we can do is suppose we want to find out whether a student's passed the master class. It's a horrible piece of pearl because we've got to get the classes, do reference. Uh, ignore that. Ignore that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not there, okay? Um, we've got to um, dereference the object to see whether what we attribute helpers allows us to say various clever things that, that save us these problems of having to dereference the contents of objects on around them. So it provides for each of the possible, each of the interesting types you can store an attribute uh, there's a helper class that allows you to define methods of the class that access fields on the attribute. So in this case, we say meta class collection error, collection hash, which says this is a hash. Uh, at this point, there are a bunch of keys for provides, um, provides has option that allow us to say, if we set, if we want to set a value on our hash, then provide a method for the class called add class. And if we want to list classes, so using keys, then provide a method of the class called list classes. So, if I now go, as before, set my classes, I can now say all of are add class, which is equivalent to extracting that, um, extracting that hash from the attribute, setting another value in it. Um, it just makes the code read kind of an equal in the same way we could use list classes to get all the keys of this. And yes, I do fail compilers, by the way. <laughs> okay. The other thing that is... Pardon, Paul? Sorry? The Moose X attribute helpers has now moved into Moose core as Moose native traits. Ah, that should help. So if you so if, if, there'll be a link from the attribute helpers docs that will show you the, a link that will take you to the new syntax. It's the same thing, except part of Moose now and slightly shinier. And so Okay, so the other sweet thing you can do with Moose, unlike most of that slide full of different helper classes, is you can ask, actually ask the class things about itself. There's a special method of the class itself, or a meta, that returns has all kinds of fun methods with a manner of useful data on it. Suit classes. I'm not going to go into that in any detail, but fundamentally you can, you can actually look at class and ask it, you know, how many methods have you got, what your super class is, um, what are your attributes, etc, etc, etc. Now, on to a couple of clever things. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, we've got these types things. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we didn't just have those restricted types to, 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 to attributes? Wouldn't it be nice? if we could actually have methods that had um, type checking by other decent languages. Turns out, can. Let me method signature. New keyword, method. Instead of saying sub attend, you say method attend. And notice now that we have a list of arguments. These are standard loose types. It does type checking for you. Not only does it do type checking for you, you no longer have to say my dollar self equal shift, and aren't we all grateful for that? Um, which is fantastic. 
um, you see, so little example, you will see that these variables in the function prototype become get instantiated in the, um, the word, in the in the in the body of the subroutine. Dollar self appears by magic without you having to do anything about it. Um, and by now, I guess if you're a Java programmer, you're starting to think, oh, this is cool. So wouldn't it be nice if you could actually write something that looked more like Java and less like Perl? Still, you can. Enter MooseX Declare. Use MooseX Declare. Class student. This is equivalent to saying package student. Use Moose. But it's now code. It now becomes much more readable, much more. A colleague of mine looked at some of this code once and said, that's not Perl. I think it bloody well is. <laughs> and inside your block for your class, you define your methods. And it's like all very Java-like, all very lovely, and all very first-class object-y. How is this implemented? What can I say? <laughs> you really don't want to know. Here be demons. <laughs> but seriously, um, it's not so much you don't want to know as you don't need to know. Um, it's implemented using devil declare, which basically sticks the interpreter on pause and plays with your source a bit and lies and cheats to the interpreter. But you really don't need to know this. It's not a source filter, thank God. Um, the reason you don't need to know what's going on is that the whole point of it is to get you away from having to construct your classes, having to write scaffolding and boilerplate just to get an object up on the screen. Where what you want to be doing is writing good OO Perl. So, to sum up, why moves? Less code, which means you have less chance of making mistakes, since it's pretty much statistically proven that the fewer lines of code you make, the fewer mistakes you make. You don't waste time doing the things that are painful. Um, repetitive tasks, you tend to cock up after a while. So if you take away the need to write boilerplate, less hashes, write attribute accesses, so on and so forth, much better off. Better object model, you can ask it things about itself. Um, and in a nutshell, we do this so you guys don't have to. You can get on with the business of actually writing code. Um, also, it's a good point here, if you're in the habit of writing unit tests, um, you, have, you don't have to do the, the unit tests such things as did I screw up my object definition. You know, the test, you can reasonably guarantee that if you call new on a new subject, you will get an object of that class back. Um, and the other way, much more descriptive code. If you look at, if we go back and look at, um, skipping through, so if we skip back and look at that, which is taken loose as far as it'll go, that is, it's pretty clear what that does. You're not looking at a new method that is doing strange things with blessed hashes and class names and making sure that it gets its um, subclasses right. I'm sorry, you have to look at Matt again. <laughs> I did have the first time. Further reading, um, there's the original Moose site at iindirective.com, which has some links to a bunch of really good presentations. Um, there's the Moose cookbook on CPAN, which was largely written by Dave Rosky, who should have been here giving this talk instead of me. Um, and there's an awful lot of really useful stuff in that. Um, and an article that actually is the, is the one that got me understanding what Moose does um, by Randall Schwartz for Linux Mac. There's that one and Cold95, which are basically an introduction to the very bare bones of Moose, about the first 10, 15 slides of what I just gave, uh, which are the ones that caused me to have an ha huh moment. Um, and as I appear to be 50 seconds from my ending time, it's a good job that that's the last slide.